tremendously helpful because there's a lot of text here. And Anybody need one? And for people who come in on this, I like Nancy Karkowski has number to say. That's not what I'm going to ask you now. Nancy Karkowski. I'm here. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is um, correct something I said last week, and thank you, David Marwick. The halal that was recited at Karbam Pesach was recited by the Levi'im. I went back and looked at the, at the Mishnah again in Sachim, and uh, it was actually by the Levi'im. The people who were Ole Regal were coming to give the, the Karban actually said a number of <laughs> Shirei Hamahalot, one of which we're going to be encountering right at the beginning of the Shir today. So there was singing by the Levim, and there was singing by the, the people who are bringing the Karban Pesach. And I still stand by my philosophical point, which is thinking back on what it must have been like to bring a Karban Pesach in the Beit HaMikdash, something that, unfortunately, we have lost for the last 2,000 years. So thank you, David. Um, I have actually two agendas today. One is to be teaching Hallel, and hopefully to inspire you. You'll see today's shear only goes through after 1.15, so at least beginning tomorrow, your Hallel in the first part of Hallel will be inspired, uh, if not the last part, because we're not going to have time to get to that today. But I also want to sort of teach some meta-concepts in Tanakh. Um, so some of you may be familiar with the theory of documentary hypothesis. In short, whether one believes in God or not, there's no arguing about it, because there's no proof, so to speak, that God exists. It's a matter of faith. But if one doesn't believe in God, one has to explain the existence of the Torah, because the Torah is a book that is in front of us, that is real, and that we know goes back at least 2,200 years because we now have copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So if you don't believe in God, where did this Torah come from? So in the 19th century, led by a uh, German biblical critic named Wellhausen, people came up with what they called the documentary hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that there are actually four different authors of this text, I should be putting this on top here, that we call the Torah, um, that they label J, E, P, and D. J is where you see Yud, K, Vav, K appear. E is where you see the name Elohim appear. P is the priestly document, which are all of the rituals, etc. And D is the Deuteronomic documents, which are the late documents leading into the Nevi'im, into the prophets. And each one of these authors didn't know anything about any of the other authors, and it was put together by this unknown redactor. And for a long time, even still in certain precincts today, this is the explanation of where the Torah comes from. However, intertextuality, which is the repeating of words and concepts and phrases between <coughs> one book of the Tanakh and another book of the Tanakh, has blown that theory out of the water. Because if they didn't know about each other, how could they possibly use the same words, the same phrases, and the same concepts? Not only is intertextuality important in the 21st century because it goes to, it speaks to the lie of documentary hypothesis, but because it so enhances our own understanding of psukim of verses in one place when we look at similar phrases of verses in another place. So we're going to do some of that today, and we're also going to look at the poetry of the Hallel. As many of you have heard me say before, the entire Tanakh is a book of poetry. There is no prose in the Tanakh. It's written as if it is prose, because it's blocks, right, of text, but it is analyzed like it is poetry of repeating words and repeating sounds and of rhymes and of chiastic structure and straight structure. And we're going to look at the poetry of Hallel today. So let's look at the first word, Hallelujah. Hallelujah appears in Pasuk Aleph 
in verse 1 of chapter 113, and in verse 9 of 113, and then it does not appear again until the last verse of verse 18 of chapter 115. Uh, Keter Aram Soba is one of the oldest documents of the Torah we have. To give you a short history, there is a, um, a book, it's not a book, it's a codex, called the Aleppo Codex. It was an ancient handwritten <coughs> scroll that was full of folios that was kept in Aleppo, Syria. We have parts of the Aleppo Codex now, and if you read a Koran Tanakh, the Koran Tanakh is based on the Aleppo Codex, which was, until we got the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest extant copy of the, of the Torah and the Tanakh. The Aleppo Codex was based on something called Keter Aron Tsova. There were two families in the 8th century called Masoretes. They're the ones who put in the Ta'am Mehamikra, the trope marks, and so decided where the verses began and ended. One was Ben Asher and one was Ben Menashe. Ben Asher got the imprimatur from Rambam, who said, Maimonides said, that Ben Asher is the authentic text. Therefore, people started using this Ben Asher manuscript called the Keter Romeva, <coughs> And that's what the Aleppo Codex is based on, and that's what most of our printed editions today of the Tanakh are based on. So the Ketar Ram Sova divides it differently than we have it uh, uh, divided here. Ketar Ram Sova says each one of the sections of Hallel begins with Haluluka. So that chapter 113 begins with Haluluka. The Haluluka that is at the end of verse nine is actually the beginning of the next parak. So it should say Hallelujah, but Saint Israel means Ryan. And then we go on to the last Hallelujah is actually the beginning of the following parak, which we will look at next week. We don't say it that way, we don't sing it that way, and yet it's an important idea to know because it sort of gives this order to the Hallel, where you're starting Hallelujah, every single one of the subsections of the Hallel, and they don't divide it into the chapters as it's divided here. We didn't divide the chapters. The early preachers of the Bible divided the chapters, and so we, we follow the, the chapters now to literally make sure we're on the same page. So let's start looking at chapter 113. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Dei Hashem, Hallelujah, Et Shem Hashem. There is the phrase uh, of Dei Hashem in the first source you see on the left side of, uh, of your page. This is one of the Shirei Hama'alot that the Ole Regal, the people going to bring Karbanot, used to sing on their way to Yerushalayim. Inei Baruch Hu Hashem Kol Dei Hashem, all of the servants of Hashem who stand in the house of Hashem at night will bless the name of Hashem. When do we stand in the house of Hashem at night? When we bring the Karban Pesach, right? It must be brought at night, hence the, the Seder at night. So that right at the beginning of the Hallel, we see a parallel to them bringing the, the Karban Pesach. Now, in this parak, there is I won't say a rhyming scheme, because it's not really a rhyme. We call it slil choser, a sound that keeps repeating. Because when you repeat a sound, it almost becomes a mantra, right? Like in Halel Hagadol, ki li olam chasdo, ki li olam chasdo, ki li olam chasdo. It becomes mantra-like. So, when you're reading this chapter, haman bihi, hamashpili, mikimi, Lahoshivi, Moshivi, you have that my over and over again, that to me uh, sound over and over again. Um, so let's go on. Ch uh, verse 3. Nimizrach Shem Hashem Mavo Mohulo Shem Hashem. Last time we talked about this as inspiring the halacha of we say, with the exception of Seder night, we only say halal when the sun 
is up. But there is a parallel phrase at the beginning of Sefer Malachi, Kimen Mizrach Shem Shamabo, Gadol Shmi Bagoyim. Now what this does, when we talk about intertextuality, it broadens the verse that we're learning. So the verse in our chapter is just from the rising of the sun until the setting, uh, Hashem's name is to be praised. But what does Malachi add using the same phraseology? Bagoyim. Hallel, in many ways, is particular to the Jewish people and at the same time as universal, right? It talks about Yurei Hashem. Yurei Hashem may or may not be part of the Jewish people, because we've already talked about the Jewish people, right? We talk about Yisrael, we talk about Beit Maharon, and then we talk about Yurei Hashem. This pasuk in Malachi is the echo of our pasuk that says very clearly from the rising of the sun until its setting, my name is great, my being Hashem, among the nations. So we've now broadened the scope of who's going to praise Hashem. All right, let's go down to, any questions so far? Okay, let's go down to Pasuk Zion, verse seven. Mikimi me afar dal, Me'ashbot yarim evyon, who raises the poor from the dust and lifts up the needy from the garbage heap. This phrase, dal ve'evyon, appears over and over again. Now, this is not comprehensive, this list, or it would have been, you know, about a 50-page handout. But I just took some um, illustrative um, sukim from different places. So this appears over and over again in Tehillim. Yechos al dal ve'evyon, he will be um, uh, merciful to the dal and evyon. Dal is poor, evyon is destitute. So in every one of these parallel verses, it is not only the poor. It is the poor and the destitute, and they often uh, come together. In every single holiday, we have one or more minhagim to include the poor. You know, the ushpizim are that we invite people into our sukkah. Pesach, <coughs> we say halach ma'anya. It's built into the halal that we are thinking past ourselves to the dal ve'evyon, and we build it into the praise for Hashem. Now, in verse eight, here is one of the more fascinating intertexts. Hashem Morishu Ma'ashir. This is from the second uh, parak, the second chapter in Shmuel Aleph in 1 Samuel. And this is the Tefillah Chana. This is the song of Chana that she sang to God when Shmuel was born. Now, just listen. It is almost parallel to the Halal. Now, last week we talked about this debate on who wrote the Hallel. Was it Moshe? Was it Yoshua? Was it uh, uh, Esther and Mordechai? But two generations before David HaMelech himself come the words, Hashem lo rishu ma'ashir mashpil af meromein. Mekim me'af ardol me'ashbot yorim et yom ma'ushim im nedibim v'chisei kavod yad v'chilei. Almost word for word the same. Did the author of the Hallel know this? Is it just totally coincidental? Is it nevuah that Chana had, and nevuah, a similar nevuah, that whoever wrote the Hallel had? These are some of the wonderful meta questions that we can <laughs> ask about ourselves. There is, there are chapters in various Nevi'im that are almost word for word the same. Perak Vav in Yeshayahu and Perak Bet in Micha are almost word for word the same. Vayav Yacharif Hayamin, Nachon Yeh Habet Hashem, O Rosh Ha'arim. How did that happen? Did they know each other? Did HaKadosh Baruch Hu give them the same Nebulah? Just a really interesting idea about how HaKadosh Baruch Hu is relating his ideas so that we record them for Posterity. Okay, let's go on to Tarantet. 
which in part reminds us that God protected us when we were in the Midbar, in the wilderness. It is that entire experience of being nomadic that we are uh, alluding to here. And Me'am Loez is a fascinating term. When Rashi uses the term La'az, Lashon Amzar, the language of a strange nation, he's usually translating into Old French. So, you know, the way we have our English translations, sometimes Rashi couldn't explain it in Hebrew, so he would say, ah, but the French word for this is, right? So you'll see in Rashi, La'az. But it's not only Lashon Amzar, it comes from this word, Lo'ez. Now, this has other implications too. And it describes part of what Mitzrayim and the exile in Mitzrayim was about. If you look at the next source, which comes from Varim Chachet, from Deuteronomy 28, this is part of the klalot, part of the curses that uh, they are listening to, the Jewish people, before they go into Israel. And it's talking about how a nation, if you don't listen to me, a nation will swoop down on you like an eagle. Goy asher lo tishma l'shono, a nation that you don't understand its language. That's the loes, but it goes on in the next pasuk. Goy az panim, a ruthless nation. Asher lo yisa panim l'zakein benar lo yachom, that won't show favor neither to the elderly nor to the young. That harkens back to our experience in Mitzrayim. So the words me'am lo'ez are so rich with this idea. It's not only the language we didn't understand, but they were mean. They were really mean, and God took us out of there. So we can draw on this other pasuk to broaden the pasuk that we are talking about. Haitayu it says in verse 2, Yisrael mam shalotav. Judah became his holy one, and Israel, his uh, kingdom, his dominion. Now, if you're like me, you go, Yehuda and Yisrael, does that mean this was written after the split kingdom? Remember, after Solomon, uh, the kingdom split into two. The kingdom of Judah, which was just Judah and Benjamin, and the other 10 tribes seceded and, and followed this guy named Jeroboam ben Nevat, and there were the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. They were exiled at different times by different people. Um, but what we don't realize is that the terms contrasting Yehuda and Yisrael go way, way back. Even to Yehoshua. Yehoshua is just entering the land. But he already uses the term Har Yehuda and Har Yisrael. So this is an ancient concept of the parallels between Yehuda and Yisrael. Same thing in Shmuel Aleph and first Shmuel. This is during the time of Shaul. Shaul was, of course, the first of three kings of the United Kingdom, right? Shaul, David, Shlomo were the only three kings of the United Kingdom of all of the Israelites together. And it talks about B'nai Yisrael and Ish Yehuda. So this is really an ancient concept that we were more than one peoples, uh, if you will. Verse three, the sea saw it and fled, the Jordan turned backward. We all know the story of Kriyat Yamsuf, of the splitting of the Reed Sea. Many people know the story of how we entered the Holy Land at the end of 40 years. Yehoshua, and that's the, the source uh, in uh, Joshua 3. Yehoshua says to the Kohanim, you carry the Aron Brit Hashem, the holy ark, you step into the Yardane, and the water's going to stop flowing. And that's exactly what happened. They step into the Yardane. The entire Jewish people crosses on dry land. The ark comes out last, and as the ark comes out, the waters begin flowing again. It is a great chapter to read if you're unfamiliar with it. Because aside from anything else, what it does is it creates a mascara, it creates a frame 
around them coming out of Egypt and going into Israel, indicating that this is one era in the life of the Jewish people, because the same thing happened when they came out of Egypt and when they went into Israel. Hence, Hayam Ra'avayanos, the sea saw and fled, Hayardeni Sobli Achar, the Jordan turned backwards. Eharim Rachtum Cha'elim, the mountains danced like rams, Ma'ot Kibnei so the hills like young sheep. Now it's interesting because there is such a midrash in Shmot Yutet, which is the parak right before the giving of the Aserat HaDibrod, of the Ten Commandments, of Ma'amad Har Sinai, of the people gathering at the mountain and preparing themselves to hear the voice of God giving them the Ten Commandments. And there it says, Vayecharad kol tar pahar ma'ot. And the entire uh, mountain trembled very much. And there's a midrash there that says, the mountain was dancing. Maybe some of you know the midrash, right? Har Sinai was plain, and all the different harim, the different mountains came and said, I'm the greatest mountain, give the Torah on me. And I am the greenest mountain, give the Torah on me. And Har Sinai said nothing. And God said, because of your humility, I will give the Torah on you. And Har Sinai starts dancing. That's the Midrash. The Midrash is built into Hallel here because it says, the mountains danced. What a beautiful mental image. That's one of the things that you often find in Tehillim. The Mechaber, whoever writes that particular parak of Tehillim, will take something that's described in a very Torah sort of way and paint this poetic picture. Hanotes kiria. Right? We're going to say that on, on Shabbat and Sunday at Rosh Kodesh. It's part of uh, Barchi Nafshi. Who spread the heavens like a curtain. You can just imagine how HaKadosh Baruch Hu creates the world through this painted image of how it happened. And so often you find the historical events painted in Tehillim <coughs> in very poetic terms. <laughs> so what happens here is first we're talking about in the third person, they danced, and then we turn to these inanimate objects and we said, why are you doing this? Malacha ayam. Why are you, see, turning back? You, the Jordan. So that we are including the inanimate objects in our celebration of what God did for us. We are raising the spark of God in the sea and the river and the mountains and the hills because everyone animate and inanimate, should be praising God for what he has done for us. Shirat um, so uh, verse 6. Aharim tirkadu ch'elem, you mountains that you skip like rams, gibaot kibnei so the hills like young sheep. This is reflected in uh, Judges and Shoftim Perak A, which is the song of Dvorah. After Dvorah and Barak have defeated the enemies, Dvorah sings praises to Hashem. And part of her praises is, Harim Nazlu Mipne Hashem Zesinai. The mountains quaked in front of Hashem. This is Sinai. Mipne Hashem Elokei Yisrael. We continue to celebrate every time God saves us because this was a Shira in response to once again being sick. Verse 7. Adon Huli Aretz. At the presence, from before the presence of the Master, the earth trembles. From before the presence of the God of Yaakov. We find this phrase, Milifne Adon, in a different parak of Tehillim, in 97, and it broadens the scope of what God is 
capable of doing. Heiru Barakav Tebel, Ra'atav Tachel Ba'aretz. This is the, the verse I'm interested in. Harim Kadonak Namasu Melifnei Hashem. Mountains melted like wax before <coughs> Hashem. Melifnei Adon Kal Ba'aretz. So it's the idea, poetically, if mountains are melting like wax, Imagine you have to go somewhere, and you're climbing up a mountain, and then you have to climb down, but the melt, mountains melt. It makes the way, the path, straight. As in one of the Shiva de Nechemka, the, the seven Haftarot of Consolation, where we say, solu, solu, that God will make all the, the uh, valleys rise and the mountains sink, so it will be a clear way back into Israel uh, when we're in Galut. And the same thing in verse 8, for the water. Kadonah mevnei ha'esh, the mountains will melt like in front of a fire. Kamayim mugarim vamorad, like water cascading down a slope. It makes it easier for the water also when, when the mountains are melting. Now, of course, turn the rock into a pool of water, the plant into a fountain of waters. I also put the stark <coughs> references there, right? Twice when Moshe hit the rock, one when that was what he was supposed to do, and the second when he was supposed to speak to the rock, and he hit it. Nonetheless, water came out of the rock twice. So this is an historical allusion and a poetic allusion to God making our lives easier. That's the end of what we call uh, Perek uh, Kufyodalit 114. 115. This is poetically an amazing chapter. You'll hear me say that about every chapter I mention. <laughs> but the verses are paired. Let's skip the first verse. Why do the nations say, where is their God? And then we answer, Our God is in the heaven. Whatever he wants to do, he does. That's a couplet. The next two are couplets. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of the human's hand. And then there's a second couplet that makes this four. They have ears, they don't hear, they have a, a nose, but they don't smell. They have hands, but they can't do anything. They can't walk with their feet. They can't speak with their throat. So you have two couplets there making a, a four verses together. Then, Yisrael, Bashem, as They uh, will be, those that make them will be like them, anybody who trusts in them. But we, in contrast, just like they say, where is your God, and we answer back, our God is in the heavens, by contrast, we have faith in God. The couple. Next couple. Beta Haron Bechu Bashem is The house of Aaron uh, believes in Hashem. Yerei Hashem Bechu Bashem is those who fear Hashem, uh, that trust in Hashem, he will be their help and their salvation. Notice, by the way, later on, next week, we are going to get to the Hudul Hashem Kito that talks about Yomar Yisrael, Israel says, that it zooms in Yoruna Beit Aharon, a subset of Israel, who is the house of Aharon, says, and then it zooms out again to your Rei Hashem, to all of those who fear God. Here we don't have, uh, we, we do have an allusion to Yisrael in Pasuk Tet. And then the couplet zooms in and zooms out to the house of Aaron, very specific, and to anyone and everyone who fears God. The next couplet. Hashem zecharanu yivarech. Hashem has has remembered us. He will bless. This is verse twelve. So verse twelve and fourteen. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless 
of those that fear Hashem, both small and great. This is now repeated a second time, right? Yisrael, Beit Aharon, Yerei Hashem, Israel, the house of Aaron, those who fear God, and it will be repeated a third time in the next paragraph. That's a couple. Yosef Hashem Alechem, Alechem Yalbenechem, Bruchim Atem Lashem, Ose Shamayim Va'aretz. Hashem is going to increase you, you and your children. Blessed are you who is made out of heaven and earth. And then the last couplet, Hashemayim Shamayim Lashem, Ha'aretz Natam Lubnei Adam, Lo Hameitim Yahavu Mukav, Lo Kol Yordei Duma. The heavens belong to Hashem, the earth he's given to the, the children of Fearfully to the children of humans. The dead do not pra praise you, nor those who go down in silence. The reason this is a couplet is because we have the heaven, we have the earth, and we have that which is below the earth. Right? So this fits together. Then you have the culminating verse, which is Vanachnu Nivarach Ka Me'ad Me'atavi Adolam. Maybe Havabuka belongs here, maybe belongs in the next one, doesn't matter. But that last um, sentence is actually the end of the couplet of the first sentence. The first sentence stood alone, the last sentence stood alone. So if you go back to verse 1 of 115, not for us, Hashem, not for us, but for your name give glory, for your mercy, and for your truth's sake. Va'anachnu, that's why we will bless you. Va is not always and, although I translate it as but, but it's more like therefore. It's not for us, it's for you. Skip everything in between, and this is the end of the couplet. Therefore, we will bless Hashem from now and forever. So what you have is sort of this circular couplet. You have one standing alone, you have two and two and two and two, and then the bottom one, which goes back to the top one, which is the end of the top one, which creates the mascara, the framework for this particular chapter. Is everybody with me? You understand what I'm saying in terms of the poetry? Now, last week we talked about how Rashi comments on the Gemara talking about Kfula, talking about how we repeat verses at the end of Alel, even though they don't actually appear repeated in Tehillim. So if you look at Tehillim, it says, Odecha once, Heaven. Um, Evan Ma'asu once, Me'et Hashem once, Zahayom uh, once, but we say it twice. And Rashi maintains that the reason we do that is because the chapter before repeats. Let's look into depth at what Rashi is saying. Hashem, lo Not for us, Hashem, not for us. That's the first repetition. Second repetition. In verse 3, that okay no bashamayim kol asher but God is in the heavens, everything he wants, he does. And then in four, atzabeim chesed zahav ma'ase, the same word as asa yidei adam, and contrasting what God does and what human beings do. Now, helahem v'lo, enayim lahem v'lo, asnayim lahem v'lo, af lahem v'lo, yidei hem v'lo, ragleim v'lo, keeps going on and on, this, again, this sort of mantra that gets us into the beat. Um, and then you have a chiastic line here in verse 7. So we've been, uh, since verse 5, a mouth and they don't speak, eyes and they don't see, ears and they don't hear, a nose and they don't smell. Hands that don't handle anything, legs that don't walk, and it should be throat that doesn't speak, but it's flipped. That's called a chiastic structure when you flip the parts of speech, and it's done on purpose. And when you're talking about interpreting um, chiasm in Tanakh, it means that it's a similar concept, but there is something fundamentally different about the concept that you need to figure out why the, the parts of speech have been flipped. So there are lots of opinions, but I'll throw this out to you. Why are 
mouths and eyes and ears and noses and hands and feet the same, but speaking through our throat is fundamentally different. Why do you think that's key? Yes. It's not a sense. It's not a sense? It's not one of the five senses. But Yedehem and Rableim are not either. But touch it. Isn't touch one Touch, one? yeah. Except what they focus on is the handling things and, and the walking. But yeah, you may be out to something, Nancy. Um, the only reason you can speak is not because your throat makes the words. That's that Words are formed by your, your lips, your teeth, and your lips. But the throat allows you to breathe. And you could not speak if you were not breathing. Interesting. So it's the fundamental of the life more yeah. than everything yeah. else. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. That's right. That you, that's, these are all great answers, and they're all correct. There is something fundamentally different about speech. Animals can smell. Animals can see. Animals can hear, right? Can't speak. Did, I didn't hear her. That's right. And then, well, yeah, did you, did you, I think you, that's what Nancy was saying. She said, um, Judy says, it starts with they have mouths that they do not speak. Which, which, right, which supports um, Nancy's claim, which is it's the breathing that's different, not only the speech. Right? If you have no throat, Pelohem, your mouth is not going to do any good. Yeah. Adam is the only one that can speak. Nobody else can speak, so that's the difference. Right. Oh. So it is one of the fundamental difference between us and, and the animal animals. world. So the speciesists who say human is just a different species and we're equal to everyone else, my response to that is, has any breed of animal developed societies and civilizations created schools, had cognitive thinking, because, you know, dolphins are brilliant. They, they may be brilliant, and we may call it a school of dolphins, but, you know, it's not the uh, Jewish day school of dolphins, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, you want to say something else? Is it also because we use, we use our mouths to bless God, and um, I guess the ought when you imitate the idols, they don't necessarily worship God the way we worship or we sing to God with, with our voice, with our throat. Yeah, absolutely. Can animals worship God? Probably not. One needs cognitive ability. I mean, one of the most <coughs> compelling arguments against becoming drunk or using drugs or any of those things, I read in Dr. Nachum Breyer's book, one of Nachum Breyer's books, where he says, when one is drunk or when one is under the influence of drugs, you cannot worship God because you have to be in charge of your own cognition and your own cognitive abilities in order to truly be able to worship God. Therefore, every time a human being opts to lose that ability, we are stepping away from God. To me, that's a tremendously compelling argument because every waking moment, we should be aware of the, of the um, blessings that God is bestowing on us. You know, today, we can't do that so much. When people learn any of the Masech Tot in Kodshim Tarot, uh, it's frightening. It's like you have to worry about where you're sitting, right? Especially as a woman, you need to worry about where you're sitting and where your husband sits down after you've gotten up. You need to worry about what is the liquid that you're pouring because some of the liquids can be macabre tuma, can be uh, tame, and others can. We used to live in a way that we were conscious every single second. When you're baking, when you're cooking, when you're walking, where you can walk where you can sit, what you can sit on, we've lost that because we've lost most of the categories of uh, Tuman Tahara. So what this is, is saying is we have to strive to be aware and conscious every single waking moment of a Baruch Isn't that what Brachot are about? 
It's making us conscious purveyors of that which we have been given. So, parenthetically, a bracha shouldn't be, oh yeah, I gotta say a shackle. It should be stopping. That water is provided to me by the one who created everything. It enhances our own ishamot to be so aware of everything going around us. Dave, do you wanna add something? Kahana couldn't serve his baby. I can't hear you. The Kahana were not allowed to serve the baby shash if they had any alcohol. That's correct. And you know, there's the Midrash that Nadav the Navihu had been drunk, and that's why they went and brought the Ezor, which is the Arshio, which is the connection between uh, those two sections. Absolutely. I mean, imagine having to be conscious. The, the Kohen Gadol, who was not allowed to sleep the night before uh, Yom Kippurim, right? Because he had to be hyper vigilantly. Cognitive, if you will. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Perek tells about the animals and the cosmos and everything yeah. sings from Kadosh Baruch Hu. And of course, there is the midrash of the frog, you know, with David the Melech and so on. So we have to the animals to sing and the cosmos. Absolutely, but Not the, the cognitive the, sense. The Sar Alam also, you know, was the first source we did last week. Are these literal or are they figurative? So most people, I mean, not to get off into this, but everyone agrees animals don't have neshamot. They have nifashot, which is sort of a, a lower level. By the way, if you haven't seen Rabbi Yadin Steinsalt's latest book called The Soul, I highly recommend it. He talks about the ruach and the nefesh and the neshama, all the different levels of the soul, and, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful work. Okay, so now we have Asa, Maase, and in Pesachet, in verse 8, Osehem, those who make these idols. Then we have the, the re repetition in verse 9, Betach Bashem, Betchu Bashem, Betchu Bashem, in verse 12 and 13, Yivarech, Hashem's a Karan Yivarech, Yivarech and Beit Yisrael, Yivarech Yirei Hashem. We have the repetition of Yisrael and Beit of Beit Yisrael, of Beit Aharon, of Yirei Hashem. And then we have in Pasuk Yudalit, Yosef Hashem Alechem Alechem Yel Benechem. When I was a kid, I thought we were just repeating the word, right? Because everybody's singing the song, you know, in Tefillah. And in those days, we weren't as mockpit about not repeating as we are now. And then I started studying this, and I was like, oh, Alechem actually appears twice. We're saying the correct words. Hashomayim in verse 15. Oseh Shomayim Ba'aretz. Hashomayim Shomayim Hashem. So Shomayim is repeated three times. And by the way, you see another chiasm between verse 13 and verse 14. Haktanim im hakdolim, the younger ones with the older ones, Alechem v'yel b'nechem, you and your children. So in 13, we come first and our children come second by verse 14. Uh, I'm sorry, our children come first and we come second by verse 14. We come first and our children come second. So that's just uh, an interesting chiasm there. All right. Let's go back now and look at some of the intertextuality that we can do Let's go to verse 2. Lama yomro havayim ayeh na elo kehem. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Where not is their God? One of the things about the Tanakh is it's got no intonations. Like, are they going, well, where is your God? Or are they going, well, where is your God? Right? It's sort of like when the Malach comes to Hagar, when the angel comes to Hagar, when she has cast Ishmael under a bush, and he says, Malach Hagar. Is he saying, what's the matter with you, Hagar? Or is he saying, what is the matter with you, Hagar? <laughs> right? How are the nations saying this? But through intertextuality, we can get a sense. Because we go into Psalm 79, 
למה יאמרו הגאים עיי אלוקיהם יוודא בגאים לעינינו נקמת דם עבדך אשר כל חמי recognize that it's at the end of our parachamim and it is drawn from safer תהילים why do the nations say where is your God uh, he is known uh, in the nations to our eyes and what is known the vengeance of the blood of your servants that has been spilled. That's where our God is. There is an undertone here that they're mocking us by saying, where is your God? And the Sub Rosa text is, our God is going to avenge our fallen blood, right? Our spilled blood. In addition, na is a weird word because na usually means Please, and we're going to say it later on. Ana Hashem Hoshia Na. That's not what it means here. It means the same as in Breshit Chazayim in Genesis 27, Vayomer. And he said, He may not Zakanti. It means now. Behold, now I have gotten old. I don't know when I'm going to die. Where now is their God? That's a very challenging way to ask something, right? And the answer is, it doesn't throw us. It doesn't throw us when you challenge us in a, a critical way. We know where our God is because later on it says, but Hashem, we trust in Hashem. That's what we do. There are so many allusions to Atzabehem throughout the Tanakh. Vayadu'et uh, Atzabehem, they serve their idols, they were a trap for them. In Dvarim, Terek Dalit, it's a warning here. It's a warning that when you enter the land, you're going to be surrounded by people who worship idols. Don't fall into their location. Don't fall into their trap, which worked for a while. Then it didn't work so well. Um, it's one of the things that we in the modern world can't possibly understand, that desire to worship something inanimate. And even with Rambam's long treatise on how did they start worshiping idols, where first it was, well, Akash Baruch who created all of this, and so we'll worship this, understanding that God created the planets, and then the reason behind worshiping the planets fell away. We just don't get it. We have other uh, Avodazars today, right? We have other idols that we worship, unfortunately, that we need to get over, whether it's money or power. But Atzabeh and Kesev is not so much. Um, so there are two us harot that I wrote here. The first is Devarim, the second is from Yechezkel, chapter 16. And my bread, which I gave to you, fine flour and oil and honey, which I fed to you, you put before them, l'reach nichoach, for a pleasant smell. They weren't thinking about halal. Because if they were bringing the stuff God gave them to idols, they can't smell. Why would you be offering something to idols? But then comes the reassurance. If you look next to Pasuk Zion, Ketomer Mikshah Hema. They're like scarecrows in a cucumber field. I don't know why they be like cucumber fields. They appear all the time, like in Chazon, the Mikshah appears too. They don't speak. You've got to carry them. They can't walk for themselves. You want to get them from one place to another. you got to carry them. Don't be afraid of them. They can't do anything to you. Don't worry. And again, in Yeshayahu, you have to carry them on your shoulders as a burden to move them. And then you put them down. They're going to stand where you put them. They're not going to move anywhere. You can cry out to them. They're not going to answer you. They're not going to save you from any of your tsaras. So that we have an allusion to the warning. Don't get drawn into it. 
And then we have the chizuk, we have the reassurance saying, don't worry about anybody who says their idols are going to hurt you. They can't do anything to you. They can't even speak. They are not alive. They don't breathe. Okay. Let's see what bitachon is. Bitachon. Dvarim Gimel in Deuteronomy 33. Uh, I'm next to verse 9 now. And Yisrael will dwell in security. It's interesting in, in Hebrew. How many of these words, how many words uh, originate from Betha? Bituach, insurance, right, against calamity. Bitachon, which means security, like you got to stop with the, with the bitachon at the airport, right? And, but it all goes back to betach Hashem, to the belief in God, right? We're hitting our bets with bituach. That's why we get insurance. Blessed are you, Israel. Who is like you? A, a, uh, a nation that depends on God, that God will save. God is Magenes Recha, the shield of your help. And once again, it's reflected in Psalm 33. Ashrecha Yisrael, Mikamocha Amno Shevashet. By the way, same phraseology, right? Word for word, in Dvarim and in Psalms, whoever wrote the psalm was familiar with Dvarim, right? Ashraf Yisrael mikamocha amno shabashem. Beit Aharon. We say it every Shabbos morning. Beit Yisrael baruchu es Hashem. Beit Aharon baruchu es Hashem. Beit Aleivi baruchu es Hashem. Yirei Hashem baruchu es Hashem. And then we get up for for Alel uh, Agadol. It's interesting that in Psalm 135, Beit HaLevi is included. In ours, Beit HaLevi is not included. If the Levim did the Shira here, that may uh, answer the question of why they're not included, because then they'd be singing about themselves. Mm -hmm. By definition, if you are singing this Hallel, you believe in God, or else you wouldn't be doing the singing of the Hallel, so Beit HaLevi is not in Hallel. Verse 11, Alamuka Ashrei Ish Yirei Et Hashem B'Mitzvot Kav Chafetz Ma'ot. Fortunate is the person who fears Hashem and desires his mitzvot. This is defining for us what Yirei Hashem means. Yirei Hashem is the person who wants to do right, who wants to fulfill the commandments. Whether we're talking about Hashem B'Mitzvot B'nai Noach or the Taryag, Right? Because non-Jews have seven commandments that they must fulfill that emanate from after the, the grief that Hashem made for the entire world with Noah. Hashem zecharanu yivarech. Yizkor kol minchotecha. Hashem has remembered us. What does he remember? Hashem remembers all of the flower offerings we brought them, and our burnt offerings he has approved of. This harkens back to the Beit HaMikdash, because that's specifically what God is remembering. Today, obviously, we don't have karbonot. Um, our lips will replace the uh, animal offerings that we once gave. And therefore, simply by singing this song, Hashem Zecharon Yitvarach, because that is our Ola now. That is our sacrifice now, that we are praising God with our lips. Okay, I got to finish up quickly. Um, let me see what do. All right, let me go down to 17. This is why we need to praise God, because those 
who are no longer with us, those who have gone down to their graves in silence cannot praise God. And this is reflected in many different <coughs> tehillim in different formats that you can see in tehillim 6, in tehillim 30, in tehillim 88. And then we actually contradict ourselves in the last verse of the parak. But we will praise God from now and forever. Adulam is an interesting um, phrase because Adulam means forever, but it means until the world, literally. It's like, Afal Pichain, nose on my mouth, yes. Like, it doesn't translate. Adulam means until the world. Does that mean Olam Hazet? We can only praise God for our eternity on this world? Or does it mean eternity into the next world? We just said that those who have died don't praise you. I leave you with that question to mull over. Hopefully, when we start saying to him tomorrow, it will be somewhat more meaningful to you. And God willing, we will finish it up next Sunday at 2.30. Hugging some air. Happy Hanukkah. Thanks,